If you have not been with us for this series, I'm looking at you. Glad to have you home from college. Uh, I'm going to have to do something quick to bring you up to speed, okay? So this is, this is Seth's fault, um, so blame him. I, I've got to do a thousand years of history, about a millennia of history, real fast, okay? So you taking notes? Okay, here we go. So, and by the way, all of our uh, kids who are here today for family worship, if you guys want to take notes, when you come in each week, there are going to be crayons and colored pencils and, and pieces of paper for you guys to, and some of you adults, I see, grab those too. That's okay. That's cool. That's all right. Take notes is good. But here we go. It all begins with that moment in time when the family of Abraham escapes down into Egypt to find relief from famine. When Joseph is a great official in the court of the Pharaoh, and what turns or what began as God's deliverance of them turns into 400 years of enslavement and bondage in Egypt until God sees fit to appoint a time and appoint a man to raise them up out of captivity, out of slavery, to deliver them into the land of promise as the people of promise. And this is Moses, the great lawgiver. And Moses gives the law as given to him by Yahweh God to the people. And a covenant is established and they go into the land of promise. But even in the trip there, things go awry. An entire generation finds himself wandering in the wilderness because of the disobedience, the obstinacy of their hearts. God in his mercy saw fit to, in the next generation, to raise up a leader, a young man named Joseph. Did I say Joseph? A young man named Joshua, who ended that period of, of, of exodus and, and brought them into the land of promise. The land was conquered and the people were established. And all was well until the people demanded to be like everybody else in the world. They weren't fit to be ruled by, governed by, belonging to Yahweh God alone. They wanted a king like everybody else had a king, and they demanded a king. God gave them a king, and it went sideways fast, just like that generation lost in the desert, in the Exodus. They waited for God himself to appoint and to choose a king, a young man named David. And this young king was established and his throne was established in such a way that God ultimately was pointing to that moment where he would again and perfectly reign and rule in the land of promise with the people of promise and establish a throne forever. But like it often does in that story, it goes sideways awfully fast. And the people rebel against that relationship. They rebel against that covenant. They rebel against those laws. They rebel against the God who graciously delivered them time and time again from their folly, from their sin, from themselves, from their circumstances. And and, and, and the empire falls apart. The kingdom falls apart. So that God raises up not this time deliverers, but instruments of his justice and his judgment. And in successive generations, three empires, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and then the Persians, will conquer that land of promise, will conquer those chosen people. The Babylonians finally destroying even the holy city and the holy temple in Jerusalem itself. And for 70 years, the children of Israel lived in bondage and captivity in a foreign land. Until God saw fit to raise up this time a pagan king named Cyrus who would issue a decree, an edict to allow the people, all the peoples that the Babylonians had conquered, allow them to return home. Allow them to return home with the funds in hand and the tools necessary to rebuild their cities, to rebuild their temples, to rebuild their lives. And we have in our Holy Scripture, in the Hebrew Bible, we call the Old Testament, we have three successive stories about three great leaders who who God uses in remarkable, extraordinary ways during this period of time. Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's Nehemiah's little book that we are studying right now. So turn with your Bibles, if you will, with me to Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. Nehemiah, the cupbearer of the king, a, a high official in the Persian court, is given the authority, given the responsibility, given the resources to take a group of former captives, his countrymen, the children of God, and go back to Jerusalem, specifically to rebuild the decimated community that is there. And Nehemiah, I love this because the book is just so fiercely practical. It's basically a, 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 a civil engineer, He's a civic administrator 
who's going in to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the city itself. The community is broken and vulnerable and scattered, and he's coming in as a strong leader appointed by God, sent by a pagan king to to make the city of peace safe and secure. To, to, to make sure that, that worship on that holy hill and that sacred temple is uninterrupted. To bind together and to build up a community that was broken and scattered. A Herculean task for this young administrator. And as we study through the narrative, this is one of those flyover books of the Bible for us. Because Genesis is fun, the the, the Torah is interesting. There's some interesting things that happened in the Exodus. Uh, there are the Psalms that are, give us kind of hope and, and give us peace and give us comfort when we need them. There are the Gospels and the writings of Paul that are, that are so clear and so helpful and so practical as we try to follow Jesus. This little bit of a few books in the middle with all these weird and hard to pronounce names, all these lists of people we really don't care about, we, we often neglect. But as we read through it, I think we're finding, and I hope that we discover, that there are themes and points of application for us today. Nehemiah is building from broken. He's rebuilding a community that is broken and shattered. Is there anything that we can or need to learn about rebuilding communities that are broken and shattered today? Of course. If you don't get the local paper... If you don't check out CNN.com from time to time, if you don't turn on the evening news, is there an evening news anymore? It's 24 hours a day. If you don't, if you don't have the internet, you, you might be blind to this. But guys, our communities are broken. Our communities are, are decimated. Our communities are starving. Our communities are hungry. Our communities are in need. And as we think about our community of faith, who we are as a distinct people, who we are as a church in the West, in America, in the Southeast, in the Bible Belt, in Georgia, in Albany, in this room. Here in Nehemiah, we have a wealth, a fountain of help and information and encouragement and challenge and warning. Because just like Nehemiah generations ago was building from broken, I think we find ourselves doing the same today. So let's read together. Let's, let's see what we can find in this passage. As we look at Nehemiah 5, 1, let me pray for us and, and we'll get to work. So Seth, you caught up? You got a millennia of history. You good? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this family of faith that is gathered here. All of the composite families that make it up, bless each of them today. We are opening sacred scripture. Words that we believe are ancient and sacred and true. Studying a book where we believe you have spoken, have spoken, definitively for us for all time. This is a holy place. This is a holy exercise. Don't let me injure the text, Lord. Don't let us injure these dear people but rather through the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who believe, would you speak to us through these words and change us. We thank you for this book. We thank you for this witness. We thank you for how you're going to speak right now to us. We thank you for the cross without which we have no hope of knowing or seeing you. So we pray this in the name of Christ. And amen. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1, now. So, all of that history, now. There arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. Okay, so what's happened? All of that backstory, all of that history, all of that, we go down into these moments where we're separated from our relationship with God. We know these moments where we are oppressed and we're crushed. We go into these, guys, we go into these really dark places as a people, and we do. Just like you and we go into really dark places as families, 
and as individuals. But in all of that, through the generations, we see when we are crushed, the Lord would raise us up. He would raise his people up. We, we go into Egypt, but there's an exodus. We go into exile, but here are Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Esther. These, these leaders to God's sins to, to raise us up and to raise us out. People who, for their entire lives, knew nothing but belonging, being property to a foreign government, now liberated to go to their homeland and be a distinct people. Return as exiles and refugees to their place of origin where they can worship their God. And banding together and working together with one mission and one heart, like we talked about last week, they do an amazing work. And hardly any time at all, working together, pulling together, all hands on deck, the city walls are raised to half of their height. They do half of the work in a moment. We should be celebrating moments when God is working in our lives and through us. J. Chup, where you at? Thank you for praying for us today. Usually don't call out the guys that pray for us, but I'm going to. J. Chup stands up, and let me see if I can quote you right. You point to this young life right here. Hey, Ella, how you doing? I'm coming down. What's up? I love this front row, by the way. You guys are awesome. So, Jesus has saved you from your sin. You want him to be the Lord and leader of your life. And, and you made that declaration. Now, how old are you? You're nine years old. Because I would call you like eight or ten. I get it wrong. You're nine years old. Nine-year-old. Have the courage to stand in front of you, the congregation, and make that declaration, to make that stand, to make that pledge and that promise. She's going to follow Jesus. And, and we had last week, Sydney, what's going on, Sydney? How old are you, Sydney? Nine years old. Nine years old, nine days you'll be ten. So you're like almost ten years old. Same thing's true. Recently with mom and dad, you asked Jesus to come into your heart. You believe he's forgiven you of your sin. You're trusting in him as your savior. You're going to follow him. And you, last week, stood in this place and made that declaration to all these people. You, you made that covenant with all these people. And we've got more stories and we've got more lives and we've got more baptisms coming in the weeks ahead. We, uh, we challenged the church to step up and to help us with a little bit of a project to get the physical campus where it needs to be so that we can wrestle the debt. And the whole point is to get ourselves into a place where we are being better resources or better stewards of the resources God's giving us. Dan's got a team leading that team. We were holding off till last week, but we're going to start the project on like the 1st of November. 1st of November. He's saying, is it the 30th? Is it the 31st? Is it the 1st? We're there. Projects beginning. Why? Because God stirred in the hearts of his people to be faithful to a challenge, believing in the mission of this church. We have resources now to move ahead in this way. Every time we open the doors for Discover Gillianville, saying, are you interested in becoming a partner and a member of this family of faith? Is God leading you in this direction? Every time, Danny James, we have a Discover, what happens? People join the church. And I get it. There are empty blue chairs around you. And because we're pessimists by nature, boy, we are. There are people sad about football games this morning. We're just pessimists. Some people are not laughing. <laughs> because we're pessimists by nature, what do we do? We, we see the empty blue chairs and we think, oh my goodness, what's wrong? Like Chicken Little, the sky is falling. It's not falling. God's people are rising to a challenge that is remarkable, Dan. And work's about to begin. And we believe this puts us in a very healthy place as a congregation. To better steward and to better invest the resources God's given us into the community and around the world. That's where we're heading. Every time we say, hey guys, is God growing the community of faith here at Gillianville? The answer is yes, it's true. He is. And we're seeing people come to Jesus. Just give me five, Carol. I'm so proud of you. So, give me five. Proud of you. Proud of you. 
Why? Because only, only God changes our hearts. Right? This isn't something you've done. Only God changes our hearts. So when Jay Chupp stands up and goes, hey man, we've got a lot to be excited about Gillingville Baptist Church, and I hear a collective, you were on stage, you heard it. And the only guy that says anything is the pastor in the back who goes, woo, like a crazy man, looking at you. Guys, even if none of that is true, Even none of that is true. And you're sitting there right now this morning as a solitary life in this place who God, by his grace, has died and called and wooed and won your heart so you belong and you're following him. If you're the only person in the room that is true for, guys, we have things to celebrate because God worked. We talked about in in, in the previous weeks that our hearts need to break for things that break God's heart. Guys, our hearts need to rejoice for things that make the Lord happy. There's so much to be, there's so much to be happy and excited about what God is doing in the lives that I see gathered together here. I want to celebrate that. I want to remember that. I want to store that up. Why? Because I know, I know the trouble's coming. Some of you guys are in the middle of the trouble right now. And I need you to remember All of those moments where the Lord was faithful and good. We have a millennia of history in this story that's ultimately pointing to the cross to remind us that whatever else is going sideways in our lives, this is true. God in his love died for you. That God in his mercy offers grace to you. That in our sin... He offers forgiveness in our rebellion. Jesus ends the rebellion by dying for rebels. And like he breaks our hearts to win us, guys, he needs to break our hearts. Let's pray he would break our hearts again. So that we can celebrate when there's a moment to celebrate. So we can mourn when there's a time to mourn. That we can be in these moments together as a family of faith. The city walls are halfway up. We should be celebrating. Why? Because God promised to do something and God was doing it. The pessimists in the room go, well, the walls aren't all the way up yet. Yeah, they're up halfway. God's at work. Church, come on, look around. The walls are halfway up. God's at work. Do you think for a minute that we're building this on our own? If we are, we're in trouble. The walls are halfway up. There's a moment to celebrate. There's something to embrace. There's something to be excited about. There's something to smile about. Looking at you. There it is. Now there arose a great outcry in the people and of their wives against the Jewish brothers. For there are those who said with our sons and our daughters, we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this thing to celebrate, something has happened. In verse 2, there's a famine, food shortage. All of this work, all of this activity, all of this toil, all of this struggle, all of this God doing good stuff, bad things still happen. Verse 3, there were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our field and our vineyards. Now, now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved. Feel the weight of that, Dad. The subtext is there. Our sons and our daughters, because of this famine, our sons and our daughters, because there's no food, our sons and our daughters who we love, we're having to sin into servitude and into slavery. We can't feed them. And our own countrymen, our own people, our own tribe, our neighbors 
who are called by the name of the same God, gobbling up our little ones. Continuing in the text, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. In verse 6, Nehemiah writes, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and, and the, these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have, have, have bought back our Jewish brothers and sisters who have been sold in to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. And they were silent. Could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you were doing is not good. Ought not you... Ought, uh, ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards and their houses. And the percentage of money, grain, wine and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we, we will restore these and required nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment. And said so may God shake out every man from his house. And from his labor. Who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said amen. And praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Alright so if you're taking notes here's our first point. Long introduction. If we want to rebuild broken community, we begin by treating people justly and with mercy. If we want to rebuild a broken community, we have to practice both justice and mercy as we deal with brothers and sisters. Here's what happened. The people came back. There's a, a, a rush into the land. All of these laborers are working on the wall. Meanwhile, the fields are neglected and the harvest doesn't come in. And even if it did, it can't accommodate and handle this influx of people from Persia. So people are going hungry. And in the effort to simply stay alive, they're mortgaging their fields, they're selling their houses. They're getting charged to death in interest. They're having to, they're having to sell their babies into service and slavery. And this time, it's not a Babylonian or Syrian or Persian tyrant who's demanding it from them. This time, it's their countrymen. It's the people who would dare call them brothers and sisters. With one side of the mouth, you're my brother, you're my sister, you're my kinsman, you're my tribe, you're my people. And with the other mouth, they are taking advantage of them. If we want to rebuild a community, we have to embrace this truth that God demands from us, his people, justice and mercy as we deal with other people. Micah 6, 8 puts it so succinctly. We know this verse. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness or mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Folks, we cannot be the community of God if we're treating people unfairly. We cannot be the people of God if we take advantage of people needlessly. Businessmen and women in the room, hear me, listen to me. I am powerless to exercise. I am powerless to control. I am powerless to shape what we do. I'm, I'm, I'm here preaching and sharing an ancient story from an ancient book to you. But as you, business person in our community, as you, person who's a leader in our community, if you're following Jesus and belonging to him, this passage needs to bring you to conviction. This passage needs to weigh on you that Jesus demands of you a certain expectation he demands of you a certain practice. He demands of you a certain ethos as you deal with people around you every day. Yes, this passage speaks to you. That treating people fairly and justly is something that we must do if we're going to follow Jesus and say we claim him away from here. And what I get to see every day, and this is so beautiful, and the practices of, of so many of you, you're striving to be that leader. 
You're striving to be that employer. You're striving to be that person. But guys, this, this, this breaks down for all of us. Why? Because in our dealings with anyone, regardless of how much power or influence or authority or capital we might have daily, we come into contact with other people and have the opportunity to treat them fairly, to treat them with respect, to treat them with dignity or not. The prophet says, what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, and love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Guys, this calls us to account. Verse 14, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. Now, that's a weird verse. What's going on? Well, he's the governor of the province. He's, he's the governor of the area. He's the guy who gets to raise taxes. And he's the guy who gets to collect taxes. And he's the guy who gets to pass the taxes along to the king. And if somewhere along there, there's a, well, let's just call it a surcharge. Let's call it an administrative fee. That the governors were allowed in the Persian system of government to take those taxes and feed themselves and their court. They were allowed to live like and expected to live like priests, or not like priests, but like, but like princes. To some extent, there they are as representing the government, collecting taxes, and they're allowed to enjoy the spoils of their labor. Totally allowed, totally legal, totally according to the rules. And yet as Nehemiah looks out, he sees his countrymen hurting, he hears the cries of widows, he hears the cries of these parents who had to sell their children into indentured servitude. And he responds, it moves him. So that he doesn't take food allowance, doesn't take the taxes allowed, doesn't keep the money for himself that he can. Not to put a burden on the shoulders of his people. He's leading forward with humility. Continue reading in verse 15. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on people. And took from them their daily ration. Forty shekels of silver. I don't know the translation. I don't know the currency exchange. Let's just say an awful lot of money. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so. Why? Because of the fear of the Lord. I also persevered in the work on this wall. And we acquired no land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm joining in the work. I'm getting my hands dirty. I'm with my people I'm a part of the project that's going on. Me and my household and my servants. He even gives an account for the accountants in the room. Here it is in verse 17. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox, six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because... The service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I've done for the people. Second point, I love this. If we're going to rebuild community that's broken. If we're going to rebuild broken community. We have to show, we have to lead with humility and generosity. It's a weird passage. Man, I don't, I don't care what he liked to eat for dinner. I don't care what's on the table, right? Why does he include this? It's kind of a, what would the kids say? It's a weird flex, right? What's going on? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, I know the people are oppressed. I've heard their cries. And I'm not going to put a burden on them that previous governors did. I'm willing to sacrifice for the good and benefit of the people of the whole. It's a remarkable statement that he's saying. Even, even to the point of saying I'm willing to be accountable to the people. I'm feeding 150. I'm feeding foreign dignitaries. I'm making sure that I do this out of my own income and not the income of the people. I'm making sure that I'm taking care of the and there's a direct comparison. It's so interesting if you're so inclined. Back in 1 Kings chapter 4, Solomon, who builds that first grand temple, gives an account of how he feeds and what his court looks like. And it is opulent. And in direct contradiction to this, Nehemiah says, I'll spell out for you what my court looks like. And while he's feeding 150 people, and that's an awful lot more than I could put in my dining room table, it's tiny in comparison. He's demonstrating and he's showing and he's expressing. He's not bragging, but he's showing humility. 
He's showing humility for the good of the community. And he's showing generosity. He's not turning people away when they come to his table. But he's caring for people as he can out of what he has. If we want to rebuild broken community, humility and generosity have to be on display in our lives. Galatians 6, 9. Paul writing to his friends says, And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good for everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Echoed through the century is this sentiment that God calls on us and demands of us and expects of us a level of hospitality and generosity, especially to those who we would call brothers and sisters. One more point in We'll be done, and I'll try to be brief. In fact, we'll have to summarize. In chapter 6, what we find are a collection, a trio of great men. Their names are Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, who's called Geshem the, the Arab. And these great men in the community, these great men among the people saw what God was doing through Nehemiah and through the people. And as the people suffered, and the people labored, and as God worked in spite of it all, through it all, these men stood in opposition to Nehemiah. As he says at the close of verse 2, they intended to do me harm. And Nehemiah, receiving this criticism, receiving this, this obstacle... In the way of great men who are putting their resources in opposition to what Nehemiah is trying to accomplish. And verse 3 says this, And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down to you. Why should the work stop when I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent a servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, I am reporting among the nations. And Geshem also, it says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. And that is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their, their king. And you have, you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. And now come and let us take counsel together. I love it. It's a threat. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write to your buddy the king. And I'm going to say here's what Nehemiah is doing. Nehemiah wants to be the king. He's telling people he's the king. He's the boss. He's the man. He's in charge. He's trying to take your place. He wants to lead the people in rebellion. And that's why he's building a wall. And if you don't come to us. If you don't deal with us. If you don't let us have a say. If you don't let us put things in the way. Then we are going to call you out to the court. And the king is going to take care of you. I love his response in verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, No such things as you say have been done. For you invent, you're inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. we want to rebuild broken community we have to do justice and love mercy we, we have to we have to let generosity and hospitality be our hallmarks but we also have to speak honestly and trust the Lord completely I, I, don't, I don't believe that that people in the in the assembled church, I just can't believe and refuse to believe that we're just we're just given to, to lies and slander about one another. I, I just don't believe that. But boy, I've been in enough churches and enough places and enough time to believe that maybe we can be given over to gossip. That maybe we can be given over to assuming the motivation of the people around us. That we can be given to listening to the stories and formulating opinions without talking to the people that we're thinking about. I think it's totally possible for us to misread the motivations of our sisters, of our brothers, of our servants, of our pastors, of our people. 
Certainly nothing like Nehemiah is dealing with where people are coming forward and saying, look, I just stand in opposition to you and I'm willing to do whatever it takes and say whatever it takes to get my way. I'm willing to lie under oath to the king to get you removed. I mean, that's just not who we are as a people. But oh, the other stuff is just as insidious. No, if we want to rebuild broken community, then we as a community have to speak honestly with and about each other. And we have to, in the midst of that, trust the Lord completely. I love how Nehemiah deals with opposition. It's not, uh uh-uh, I didn't say that. I'm going to write him a letter back, and my letter's going to be longer. I mean, they're not taken to to Facebook, right, and trying to get ahead of the story. They're not worried about the PR. Nehemiah's not worried about, you know, shaping and controlling the narrative. Nehemiah simply at the end of all of it says, you've not spoken truly. I'm going to trust the Lord. You've not spoken truly, but what matters more than what you are saying is the wall's not finished. Lord, strengthen my hands. You've, you've not spoken, you've not dealt honestly But that doesn't matter because God's at work. We have to join him there. Now, rebuilding community requires a trust and an honesty with each other. And at the heart and the foundation of that honesty is that we have to honestly be trusting the Lord. Because, boy, that's the other part. Where we celebrate, we celebrate, we celebrate little ones coming to faith. So we dare not do anything to manipulate it. And to make it emotional. We trust the Lord to work. We, we celebrate resources coming in for things that are, is on the heart of the leaders of the church. Pray we invest them well, but man, we, can't, we can't manipulate it. Can't twist the arms. Can't grease the tracks. We've got to trust the Lord. We want to see the community of faith here locally grow. We really do. But boy, we know who we are and who God's called us to be. And like Luther, here we stand, we can do no other. So we invite people to join the work that we think God's called us to. And we know who we are and we're just going to be who we are. We're not going to manipulate people to grow a crowd. We're going to trust the Lord. And as we deal with each other, here's, here's the pledge, here's the promise. I know you're a work in process. I know you're in progress. I know that sanctification is this really fancy theological way of saying, I'm still broken, but I belong to Jesus, and he's making me what I need to be. And it's going to be a long time before I get there, but I'm in process. I'm with you. I'm one of you. I'm, I'm part of you. So we're going to be in process together. We're going to be broken together. We're going to be trusting Jesus together to do those things that only he can do. And I'll shoot straight and be honest with you in the process. So the honest truth is this, guys. God is at work. In a million little ways, all across this room. And our our sisters and our brothers are, are broken and hurting and in need in a million little ways all across this room. And there's this big mission called Albany, Georgia, a community that is broken and needs the church to be the church. It needs this church to be a great church. That's the truth. And together, we're going to get to work on that wall and we're going to trust the Lord to do what he will do.